the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, stands. One, one nation, nation under God, God. indivisible, indivisible with, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Um, let me get my agenda back up. Okay, so in attendance, we have Commissioner Torman, Commissioner Francis, Commissioner Howell, and myself, Commissioner Lewis. If anyone else jumps on, be sure and let us know. Um, so we're gonna do a work session. Uh, I guess I'll announce now that we will not be uh, hearing the conditional use permit for CW Basin that was pulled at the last minute. So anyone who's here to listen about the basin project, um, staff will get back to us at some point here soon and let us know when it gets re-upped, re but it got pulled for some reason. Um, we will be hearing the second item tonight, which is ZTA 2021-8, County Proposed Manufacturing Zoning Amendments. Uh, I understand Scott Perks is gonna be presenting tonight. That's correct, Commissioner. Hey, Scott, uh, why don't you go ahead and fill us in. All right, you guys, um, I'm gonna share my screen. We didn't send over the document because we were just gonna walk through it with you guys over, um, over the computer here and share screen. So let me go ahead and share that here. Okay. Okay. Uh, you can see this uh, PDF pulling up here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we as a county um, have been entertaining quite a few pressures for development out west, um, West Weber County in the manufacturing zone. So this uh, particular amendment doesn't necessarily impact the Ogden Valley substantially, but we are making some modifications to the manufacturing zone um, to facilitate some of that uh, development demand out west. And since we do have a small manufacturing zoning uh, classification in the valley in the MV1 zone, we did wanna show you these edits and get your input on that before we bring it to you guys for public hearing. It'll be uh, at a public hearing with you guys on the 28th of December. We've already taken it through a public hearing with the Western Weber Planning Commission and have um, a, a positive recommendation on this, this ordinance. Um, before we jump into this, um, there's, a, there's a couple of things in here that are housekeeping in nature. There are a couple of cleanup items that we've been eyeballing for quite some time and found this as an opportunity to address some of those. So. Some of these edits are not necessarily um, spurred on by the manufacturing zoning uh, edits, but uh, are just a chance for us to clean up a few things. So I'll, I'll mention those as we address them. Um, so I'm gonna scroll through this and we'll talk through it. Feel free to stop me anytime you guys have any questions or would like to you know, add some feedback. Um, otherwise, we'll, we'll try to keep it somewhat high level, but we'll get into the details as you guys see necessary. Does that sound like a plan? Cool, okay. Um, I'm gonna zoom out just a little bit here. Let me know if, if the text becomes difficult to read. So the first thing on the list is actually a housekeeping item. Um, <clears throat> in the most recent legislative session, the state of Utah has uh, kind of put some pressure on the counties to define and regulate concentrated or large concentrated animal feeding operations. And if we don't do that before February 1st of 2022, then it would be a, an allowed use in the county and we'd lose our ability to regulate it. So we're gonna go ahead and take that opportunity to get on top of it. So the first thing you see here is a definition of a large concentrated animal feeding operation. And you'll notice that the definition uh, reflects um, or references the state definition. I'm going to read that here real quick, just so you understand what it is we're, we're working with through the state definition. So the state defines a large concentrated animal feeding operation as follows. 
Um, so an animal feeding operation that stables or confines as many or more than a number of animals specified in any of the following categories. So we're talking about 700 mature cows, 700 veal calves, or sorry, 1,000 veal calves, 1,000 cattle, 2,500 swine uh, weighing 55 pounds or more, 10,000 swine weighing less than 55 pounds, 500 horses. So you, you get the idea. It's, it's a pretty large concentrated operation of, um, of sizable proportion. So we're saying that the county's definition is this state definition. Okay. I'm going to jump ahead in the text amendments um, real quick to address the other section that is associated with uh, the large animal feed operations, and then we'll come back. But what we're proposing is um, injecting a new section under our standard section. So under section 10415, um, we're adding this paragraph. So we're saying that a large concentrated animal feeding operation as defined by state code is a use not permitted in any zone in unincorporated Weber County. Considering all criteria of the state requirements, it has been determined that the geography and geometry of the densely populated areas of the county, both existing and planned, renders virtually no suitable location for the siting of a large concentrated animal feeding operation, except for higher elevations that are generally inhospitable for year-round animal operations. So we're basically saying there's really no place for that large of a feeding operation. Now, just so you guys are aware, the Western Weaver Planning Commission asked for us to pull this out of the ordinance and look at it with a little bit more detail. So their recommendation is not to pass this language on, um, but to uh, hear it as a separate item where they have a little bit more input. But we wanted to get the language out in front of you guys so we could bring it back for public hearing at a, at a future date. But that was our first stab at this. Western Weaver is a little bit concerned because there are some larger operations out West that we want to make sure we're not impacting them. Um, so we're going to look at it again. You guys have any questions about the language, the definition, and then the, uh, the um, regulation that we're proposing here? So does it leave the door open where, you say, where it says at the end, um, except for locations or siding of them in higher elevation? Does that leave the open that that could be a possibility then? I just concerned with the watershed areas up here. Yeah, well, I think we're saying that in the higher elevations, there may be land that is separated from um, residential areas, but we're also saying that it's not very hospitable because these concentrated feed operations are, are pretty high density animal wise where uh, they're basically just being stored, they're not able to really graze because the land can't uh, keep up right. the land. So we're saying that in those areas, even though there may be some land available up there that's large enough and separated enough from the, the population that it's still not hospitable and it's still not a good place. I just wondered if the language needs to be a little bit stronger because it almost seems like an animal could go year round, it would be okay. Yeah. I know that uh, we worked with legal counsel on this and Charlie may um, have some, some feedback on what was drafted uh, or why this was added um, through Cortland Erickson's feedback. And uh, Cortland, are you on? You may actually be able to address this as well. Have you worked with the um, conservation districts with this at all? No, we didn't. Sorry, this is Charlie. So this paragraph is just explaining the legislative intent. Um, it's actually the meat and potatoes of the restriction is going to be in the zones themselves. So if you look at this, this is 104-1-5. This is just um, zoning in general. And we wrote this just to make sure it's very clear that we're addressing the state code requirement here. But if you look in each of the zones, we, we do say if it's not specifically listed as allowed, it's not allowed. That's where the regulation for the uh, for any of the higher hinterlands areas would come into play and essentially say you can't do it there. I would also add that the first sentence there is the rule that is established. 
this type of operation is a use not permitted in any zone of unincorporated Weaver County, period. That is the rule. The next sentence is an explanation of why that rule is being adopted. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions on that, you guys? There again, though, um, it'd be great, I think, if it could be ran by the association or the conservation districts. I mean, how would they feel about that? That it wouldn't for sure. I mean, I can't see that there is any place, but I don't know. Just maybe as a courtesy, I don't know. Okay. I, I'm, I don't have any problem with it. It looks, looks good. Okay, I'll make a note of that. Okay, uh, backtracking just a little bit, going back to where we left off. Okay, another housekeeping item, um, lot frontage definition. We're just simplifying this definition to mean um, that a lot frontage is also referred here in as street frontage or street frontage of a lot um, means the yard lot line abutting one side of a street uh, right of way. So it's a little bit, a little bit simpler than before where we're having a little bit of a standard in the definition. So we're removing that standard and just clarifying the lot frontage definition. Any questions on that? I apologize. There's, there's just a couple of these housekeeping items that we're going to have to muddle through real quick before we get into the, the heart of what's proposed as this you know, manufacturing zoning amendment. So the next one, again, is, is housekeeping. We're addressing Scott. the definition of a lot of record. Excuse me, Scott. Yep. I can read it, but it would be a, a little bit easier if it were just a little bit bigger. I don't know if you can zoom in. It looks like there's... Okay, thank you. Is that better? Is that... Yes. That work? Mm -hmm. Okay. So in, in our code, we have a, a couple of definitions of a lot of record, and we've got a lot of historic parcels that um, were created, you know, either before zoning or before uh, subdivision requirements were enacted. And so uh, we have kind of a grandfathering of parcels where we consider them lots of record, where they could pull a land use permit and a building permit without necessarily taking them through the subdivision process prior. We're clarifying a couple of dates in here. Um, we're indicating that anything that is um, at least 100 acres would meet that definition just by nature of its size and ability to meet any zoning that we have in the county. Um, we're, we're wanting to clarify a few of these things. There has been some confusion as to uh, some properties meeting or not meeting some of these definitions. And so this is kind of a, a county staff clarification of some of these definitions uh, to help with identifying what is and is not a lot of record. Um, <clears throat> and one thing that also kind of spurred on this, um, this particular definition here in, in paragraph F where we're saying a parcel of real property that contains at least 100 acres when we have uh, large parcels out west, you know, some of them upwards of a thousand acres, you know, maybe a little bit shy of that. We've got a lot of those out west, um, large ag pieces that are in the manufacturing zones. We've got several uh, large entities looking to potentially buy and develop some of those parcels. And uh, one of the concerns that they had, had raised was whether or not it was a lot of record or if it was developable without, you know, going through the subdivision process. Um, and in, in our in our code, in order to get a building permit, we needed we need to be able to say that a parcel is a lot of record before we could issue a land use permit. And on some of these large, you know, multi hundred acre parcels, you know, they haven't been subdivided, but they they technically would be a lot of record just because they haven't changed since the you know the either early 1900s or you know haven't haven't really changed at all over time. And so we wanted to clarify in this lot of record definition that anything over 100 acres is able to meet any of our zoning ordinances. And so we would be able to, to define it as a lot of record, which um, satisfies some of those larger entities looking to locate in these manufacturing zones, not worrying about whether or not they need to take it through subdivision before it has any you know, development right. Okay. Is there any questions about that? Uh -huh. This is this is Steve down in the commission chambers. Hey, just really quick on um, letter D on this. 
was it wasn't it the Western Weeby Planning Commission that brought up um, a concern with the in saying on December thirty first, nineteen ninety two, they thought that that meant that every every parcel or that was described in a deed that was recorded on this specific day. Were we going to have it say like recorded on or before or something like yep. that? That's right. Yep, that was one of the things that they had caught in in reviewing this language. You're right. We haven't made any changes to the ordinance since they provided their recommendation, but yeah, you're absolutely correct. We want to make sure that we've got a line in the sand as far as the date is concerned. We're, we're basically saying here that if you have a, a parcel that was created um, and is described in a deed sales contractor survey on or before December 31st of 92, um, and that parcel complied with zoning when it was created, then, uh, then we would say it's a lot of record or grandfathered parcel. Yep, good catch. So that, that will be adjusted before we take it forward as a formal ordinance for adoption. Cool. Okay, so that's a, another housekeeping item, not necessarily related, but somewhat spurred on with this 100 acre piece here um, by what we have going on out west. Okay. <clears throat> Now this next section is inside of our um, rezoning requirements. So section 10254, uh, this is talking about what needs to be submitted in an application for a rezone. Um, and, and you'll see item B3, previously it had, it had read letters of feasibility from the appropriate state or county agencies for water and wastewater. So if somebody's wanting to, to rezone a property, they would need to provide us with letters of feasibility as part of their application for that rezone. And what we have found is on some of these large parcels out west, you know, many of them aren't able to obtain uh, a letter of feasibility um, when they start doing due diligence and looking at site selection and feasibility. Most of these large pieces are, are needing to either create their own district or they're waiting for larger pieces of infrastructure to come into place before they would actually be able to begin operating. And so we have a, a large project out west, you know, uh, as an example, that they, they will need to establish that water district before they can even consider you know, rezoning. And so they can't apply for a rezone, they can't, uh, they can't really move forward on purchasing a large piece of property um, without knowing they have some sort of feasibility or some viability that their development can move forward, you know, because there simply isn't a, a, a district or a water company able to provide them with a letter of feasibility up front before they do any rezoning. So <clears throat> what we'd like to change this to is as part of their submittal for a rezone, they provide us with a narrative that explains, you know, the potential for future access to water and wastewater facilities. So it's a narrative, you know, describing what it is and how it is they're going to provide uh, for their scale of development. And that might mean that they are able to get a letter of feasibility, but if they're in an area where that doesn't exist or if they are, will be forming those districts, um, they can explain that to us. Now, the Western Weaver Planning Commission wanted to tack on a little bit to this language and they wanted to have a little bit of a time scale where if, for example, we were to approve a rezone based on a narrative that explains how they're gonna provide these utilities, that they have a you know, limited amount of time to make good on that, um, that feasibility. So if, they, if they're ex explaining to us that they're gonna form a district, then they would need to do so within those two years. And if they don't, then you know, perhaps we, we um, revoke the rezone or have that zoning converted back to the original zoning that was there prior to the rezone. Does that make sense? Do you guys have any questions on that? That, that seems fair to me. Um, give them some time to do their due diligence, see if they can make it work before the actual rezoning goes through. Okay. Yeah, and that was that was the issue. Is there a lot of these really large sites, you know, large scale developments? They there's a lot of due diligence. It's not uh, quite as simple as purchasing a single family home. I mean, there's a lot of feasibility that needs to be determined before they can close on a property. But they need to have some assurances that it's developable, and the county can work with them before you know a formal will serve letter or a you know, letter of feasibility is is provided. Okay. I'm gonna zoom out just so I can navigate and then I'll zoom back in when we get to the next edit here. 
Okay, so this this next edit is, is housekeeping in nature as well. Um, and this is where we're talking about uh, zoning boundaries and where if there's any uncertainty about zoning boundaries, how do we clarify? Is it to the center of the road? Is it to the edge of the property? And uh, this is a, a cleanup item. I know Charlie was eyeing for a little while and you'll notice that we've kind of rearranged existing language below where we, we used to have a section here that was titled rules or ordinance and maps where we've kind of cut it from there and we're creating new sections. Um, so the language is staying the same. It's a little bit of reorganization. So um, Charlie, do you want to add anything to the intent behind these couple of housekeeping edits? So this one was to consolidate uh, the section that comes after. So this is 104-1-2. 104-1-3 was very much related to boundaries of zones. And I wanted to free up 104-1-3 to provide a, a different um, uh, section. So um, as you can see, it used to be called rules of ordinance and maps, rules or ordinance and maps. Um, I've changed it to, if you scroll up, Scott, 104-1-3 is changed to rules of interpretation. So this is new language here. And then rules of ordinance and maps, I just um, put as a different, a different um, uh, subcomponent of boundaries of zones. So now you have an A and a B in boundaries of zones, moving things from 104-1-3 into 104-1-2, and now new um, interpretation rules in 104-1-3. Perfect. There's no material change in this, is my understanding correct, Charlie? We're just kind of readjusting and... Right, so planning commissioners, what, what this, um, this new language says is that what we have written in this code is plenary. Plenary means that's all there is. Um, in essence, our, our code is already written that way, but for some reason, our code does not specify that. Um, and so what we're trying to say here is that the list of uses that you find or the list of regulations or the list of um, development standards that you find in the zoning ordinance is, is what there is. And so if, for example, you want to do a use on your property that's not listed in one of those zones, then it wouldn't be allowed. So in other words, if it is listed, it is allowed. If it's not listed, it's not allowed. So when the, where the code is silent, we're essentially saying not allowed. And the reason why a lot of zoning codes are, are built that way is because it's a lot easier to anticipate the things that we have listed, but the multiple, multiple plethoras of things that we haven't listed or haven't even thought about, um, we'd just rather not address them until somebody actually specifically comes and asks for an ordinance amendment to allow it. And then we can study that land use and figure out how it applies and, and how it affects other people and, and other uh, property owners in the area. Perfect. Any questions about that, commissioners? Nope. Okay. Okay, continuing on, here's our uh, concentrated animal feeding operation language that we already addressed. So we'll hop down. This is kind of where we're getting into the meat and potatoes of the manufacturing zoning edits. So we'll start with this header paragraph, which explains the use tables below. Um, this is new language, and it's uh, the first little bit is 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 more clarifying in nature. Where we're saying that you know anything that is listed as a P is a permitted use. Anything listed as a C is is allowed only when authorized by a conditional use permit. Uh, the N not allowed. So it's pretty you know explanatory. We're we're just explaining what does P, C, and N mean in the table. Um, we then go on to explain kind of the, uh, the waterfall provision of uses in the C zones, water falling into the M zones. And to, to clarify here, you know, this, this zoning ordinance is for both Western Weber and Ogden Valley as far as the use tables are concerned. So all manufacturing zones are listed in this table, whether it's lower valley or upper valley. And so this next sentence is specific to Western Weber, where it says, unless more specifically regulated in the following table, any use listed as a P in the C3 zone, which is only a Western Weber zone, is, is a permitted use in each manufacturing zone. Um, and any use listed as C in the C3 zone is a conditional use. So what uh, will this paragraph is intending to say, and we've already acknowledged we need to make a, a little bit of a change here for the Ogden Valley, 
is this is only applicable to Western Weaver. If it's a P in the C3 zone, uh, then it would be a P in the M1 zone. Um, so it would waterfall from the, the uh, commercial zones into the manufacturing zones. In the Ogden Valley, it would be anything in the CV2 zone would waterfall into the MV1 zone. So uses that are only available out in Western Weber in the C3 zone would not be uh, water falling into the MV1. Uh, so that's, a, that's an edit that we know that we need to make, but the intention of this uh, paragraph here is to explain you know, that waterfall provisions, okay? Uh, next paragraph here um, is applicable in both upper and lower um, areas. So all uses listed are indoor uses unless explicitly stated otherwise with the terms outdoor or yard. Now this sentence came about because we have a large food manufacturer looking to locate in West Weber and they're concerned about their food processing, um, food manufacturing and processing and packaging being impacted by surrounding uses that may be off-gassing or creating odors that they don't necessarily want to be bottling up in their food products. So we wanted to go through and kind of clarify, okay, you know, there are uses that are indoor and there are uses that are outdoor. Um, and we've done that uh, in the tables below, but uh, to clarify in this header paragraph, we wanna just say, hey, Everything is indoor unless it's explicitly um, stated otherwise as outdoor or yard, okay. Going on, when a use fits more than one use listed in these tables, the more specific or more restrictive provision applies. So that's more clarifying in nature. In all manufacturing zones, any manufacturing process that will result in odors, dust, fumes, or other airborne contaminants that have the potential of negatively affecting the manufacturing of food products intended for human consumption or the work environment in which such manufacturing occurs shall, be pro shall provide mechanisms by installing or otherwise that will keep the airborne contaminants from leaving the site. So this is in all manufacturing zones. If they're going to have any of this off-gassing of you know potentially impactful um, odors, dust fumes, or contaminants, that they either need to provide some sort of containment, um, or you know verifying that they are not able to leave the site. Uh, this this language is also um, a result of that uh, that use coming in out west, where they want to be you know pretty clear about you know how and what is able to float around in the air. Now we know that the EPA already regulates a lot of these types of you know concerns, but this header paragraph is also clarifying in nature. Do you have some any questions about these these kind of entry statements that are explaining the use tables below? Is it covered in other places if um, those order dust fumes or airborne contaminants negatively impact other like residents or other things or um in the c zones or the the residential zones you mean from yeah. my knowledge the rest of our zoning ordinance for for different zones don't specifically you know address the manufacturing and you know, the processing that happens in manufacturing zones and you know, the odors, dust, fumes, or contaminants that may be created in those zones. You know, we don't really have those uses as permitted in, in residential um, or commercial areas. And so I, I don't believe we have any language that addresses that specifically in those other zones. I'm, I don't know if you understood what I said. I meant they don't want to, to contaminate other food, but this is all for indoor. Unless it's stated otherwise specifically in the table below. Uh -huh. So I'm just saying if it produced airborne problem for people living in a residential area or commercial area a little ways off, is there anything that covers that? There is, yeah, and we'll, we'll go through that. We'll show that there, there okay. are also some separation requirements. So if, so for example, if there's a manufacturing zone next to, you know, a, a residential zone, there's some separation or, you know, even if it's manufacturing next to commercial, there's some separation in, in the uh, tables below. Does this apply to like agriculture? Like somebody's got a bunch of cows out there. And, I mean, you're going to get fumes from cows. Does that, does that apply to that? 
So um, it, it technically would. And let me look through here. We don't um, just look at it. Just, is it is it discouraging people from from raising livestock? I guess is what my ultimate question is, <clears throat> because you know that's that's a big part of the Weber County lifestyle. I would say is, is yeah. raising livestock, and and to not and if that puts any restrictions on that, I think that's a that's a problem. So in, in the tables below, and this is kind of jumping ahead just a little bit, but. Um, the use that is defined as farm for the raising and grazing of horses, cattle, sheep, or goats is not a permitted use in the MV1 zone. Um, so we're talking about the manufacturing zones here. So if let's say that you have an ag zone next to the MV1 zone, um, then you're not you're not in this zone and you're not um, you're not regulated by this off-gassing language. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the clarification. Mm -hmm. But someone could have a farm in a manufacturing zone. Well, so in, in the use tables in the MV1 zone, the um, in the in the table below we're saying that it's not a permitted use. So but if they're grandfathered, if they're grandfathered in. If they were rezoned to MV1, do you mean? Did you ask me a question? Yeah, sorry. Are you saying if if they are already operating a farm in the MV1 zone? Mm -hmm. And they're not changing their use. Yeah, then they would have they would have the grandfathering to where they wouldn't need to to comply with the language uh, of this new ordinance. But if they were to make any changes, you know, if they were to scale up or, or what have you, then they would. So the dust, the fumes, the odors, that wouldn't affect them? Under their current operation. Right. Um, no, but I don't believe that that's the intention here. Now it does, I mean, it does raise the question out west and we've got a lot of agricultural zones that are immediately adjacent to the manufacturing zones. Um, and you'll notice that in the use tables, as we start to look at the use tables, um, there's, there's separation. So if, for example, a food manufacturer wanted to locate in the manufacturing zones and their manufacturing zone is, is directly adjacent to an agricultural zone, that they have some pretty strict uh, setback requirements. So there is quite a bit of distance that, that is created between you know, someone potentially looking to site uh, an operation and, and those impacts. So maybe, maybe let's take a, a look at the table and uh, keep this kind of fresh on our minds as far as that impact to ag. And we can look to see if, um, if what is here addresses that concern or if there's maybe a you know, reason for additional concern. That sound good? Okay. Now, one thing that um, is difficult on this document with our new uh, code software, MuniCode, the way that the red lines are formatted don't allow for a very easy side-by-side -side comparison. Um, <clears throat> what we're showing in this particular use table You'll notice the MV1 zones are all crossed out. And that is actually because when we took this to the Western Weaver Planning Commission, we were under a little bit of a time crunch and we were trying to have them review just the Western Weaver provisions um, and then potentially move these adjustments forward for a public hearing with the County Commission without affecting the Upper Valley at all. So we pulled the Upper Valley zoning classification MV1 out of the table uh, to facilitate that timeline. That timeline has since slowed down a little bit. And so when you're reading this table, um, everything that is in red here crossed out is technically, if we were to move everything forward at the same time, both Western Weber and Ogden Valley, we would uncross this, um, this uh, column in the table for MV1 and move it forward for both Western Weber and Ogden Valley um, if, if that's how you know, the timeline will work out for us. 
So as you're looking at these tables, let's just pretend that everything that is crossed out in red is actually in black as a proposal instead of being stricken. Okay. Can, now, can I make a comment, you. Chair? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. I, um, this is not the first time we've done this where we've kind of listened to what you guys change on the code. And it, I'm getting a little, I'm a little concerned because I feel like I didn't get a copy of the changes and I feel like we're just kind of being told, I would really like to have seen these before so we can kind of review that. I mean, I don't know if I'm missing something, but I feel like this happened last time too, where we didn't get the copies of it. We didn't see it until we're reviewing it and then we kind of acted on it. So I, I guess I'm a little concerned that I'm, we're kind of having to just follow along versus being able to review it for ourselves. So I guess I would ask in the future that we get copies of this. I don't know if that's not part of the plan or if I'm, if I'm new to that, but I feel like that was not too much to ask. No, it's not at all. What, what we uh, have done in the past when we weren't meeting by Zoom is we'd have paper copies where everyone could kind of uh, follow along at their, own, at their own leisure, which made it a little bit easier. Sometimes um, producing this kind of information out in advance um, can lead to uh, some concerns uh, due to misunderstanding or misinterpretation. And so it's, it's a lot easier. Um, it seems to be a little bit more beneficial to have um, uh, one of the planners or authors of it walk the planning commission through, but we're, we're certainly sensitive to uh, the idea that there's, there's, there's just not enough time to review it. Um, today's meeting is just a work session, so our intention is to kind of introduce you to it um, before we go to a meeting where we want you to make a decision on it, and the meeting where we want you to make a decision on it, um, you'll have that in your packet, so it'll be there uh, well before um, the, the, time, uh, the time of the meeting. Does that make sense? Does that, does that sound okay? Yeah, it makes sense. I just I wanted to put that out there because I felt like this is this is not the first time I've just been told what we're trying to do, where I'm not able to review it and kind of look into it a little bit, so I have an idea of what we're talking about. I'm just kind of being told, and I understand the reason the rationale behind having uh, someone explain it, but I I would love to kind of be prepared for what we're looking at, and I think that's not too much to ask. Yeah, I appreciate that. So um, why don't we do this? When Scott's done kind of running everyone through, this really is just intro um, intro to the changes. Um, we'll have Scott throw it in an email out to you guys um, where you can review it at your leisure, um, spend a lot of time on it. And if you've got questions or comments, we can um, uh, correspond over email on that. And then we'll make sure we tidy things up before we get it before you guys can make a final decision um, in your next packet. Is that is that fair? Sounds great. Sure. Yeah, yeah and uh, Commissioner, uh, the, the intention, I think Charlie's explained this, I just wanted to clarify as well. This is a work session, so we're just, we're wanting to walk through it first. We'll give you a clean copy with all of the, the comments that we received today um, ahead of the, any public hearing where you're able to you know, review it on your, on your, uh, your time um, and then get back to us before we make any uh, action. So there's no action being taken tonight. So we want to just kind of educate everybody, have you guys review it, and then uh, we'll come back at another uh, discussion to, to review it with the public and then uh, move forward with a formal recommendation at that time. Okay. Does anybody have any questions with the, you know, the explanation of this red being crossed out? What we're looking at here is we're pretending that it's not crossed out. We're going to review it as if it's proposed. Okay. Now, um, as we go through this, we'll just kind of go through and look at what's permitted, not permitted, and conditionally permitted. There has been some, some rearranging in these tables. What we'll, we'll used to be present, and I'll, let me actually just scroll down to the, uh, the existing tables so you guys can see what existed prior, and then we'll come back to what's proposed. Um, like, I, like I mentioned, there's not a way to review them side by side based on the way that this program formats, and so you kind of have to go do a lot of flipping back and forth. So. I've done that for us and I'll explain what the differences are. Um, so here's the existing table. You'll notice that um, we just have a table, MV1, M1, M2, M3, zoning classifications on the headers, a column for each of them, permitted versus not permitted versus conditional use. And it lists, it lists everything in alphabetical order, top to bottom. So we're starting off with accessory uses, aircraft, airport, and kind of go through alphabetically top to bottom. 
of all the manufacturing um, uses that could potentially exist in any one of those four manufacturing zones, okay? So we're taking this table and we are trying to split this up into categories rather than just have a long list of alphabetical uses. We want to split it into categories of, of manufacturing um, processes. So starting at the very beginning of the manufacturing process where we're talking about extraction of raw materials, you know, the processing of those materials, the you know, the, the smelting and the dilution and bringing everything into usable workable materials and then taking those materials and actually manufacturing a product um, for packaging and distribution. So all the way from raw materials to shipping of, of completed goods. And so we wanna break them into clear segments um, and, then, and then kind of go from there because as we're looking at the manufacturing zones, we're looking at, you know, MV1 or M1 as being the least intensive, M2 being slightly more intensive, M3 being the most intensive, and then graduating those uses by intensity. And so we're gonna split them into, you know, categories. And this was spurred on again, because we have demand for large manufacturing uses out West where they want some protections from, you know, the impacts of certain types of manufacturing. Um, for example, for this food manufacturing company, they were concerned about uh, rubber production. You know, rubber is you know particularly smelly and sticks to stuff and clings to stuff, and they wanted to see how you know some of those types of manufacturing processes would be separated by zone. So that's that's kind of where we're we're looking at this. We know that there needs to be more work done on the separation of uses. So this is kind of a a preliminary adjustment to get our manufacturing zoning to where we have a little bit more stratification in the uses based on M1, 2, or 3, and MV1 as it's kind of by itself up in the upper valley. Um, but we also have the intention of coming back <clears throat> and further stratifying these uses in more generalized categories. So you'll notice in, in this table, we have very specific uses still listed like an animal hospital um, or a kennel um, or, you know, aircraft parts or missile parts. Those are very specific manufacturing processes that we would like to further distill down into more generalized categories. Um, so there's more work to be done on this and we're aware of that. We just want to kind of give um, a sense of where we're coming from and why we're going in this direction. Now, the other thing that we, I want to talk about is before we jump into the actual uses and go you know, line by line here, is when we put together this table, <clears throat> we had the existing table in alphabetical order, um, and then we had the, you know, the intention of putting them into groupings of uses based on their intensity and then their, their spectrum from raw material to finalized product. And in doing so, some of the existing uses, um, we took duplicates and we, we tried to get rid of some of the duplicates. And we also tried to group things together that um, were available in some zones, but not other zones. And so there's not a, a direct comparison, but there are some things in this table that will not match up with the existing table, okay? And I don't want to confuse anybody, but it is a bit to wrap your head around initially as we start looking at this. So bear with me as we go through. Okay. Um, Charlie, do you want to make any other comment before we dive a little bit deeper on this as far as the formatting and the reason behind making some of these changes to the tables? Just briefly. Um... I don't know if any of the planning commissioners that are on right now were on at the time that we started our land use table discussions. Um, but if, if you were here at the time, um, this is very similar to what we did with the um, agricultural zones, similar to what we do, uh, will be doing with the residential zones, essentially consolidating. So we're not having so much regulation that is so hyper specific, but instead kind of um, finding the common themes in each of these regulations. Uh, for example, um, in, the, in the commercial zones, uh, a candy store and a confectionery. There's, there's no reason to regulate those two separate, uh, separately. In fact, um, there's probably no reason to regulate them any differently than any other baked goods. 
Um, and so I, there are ways that we can kind of streamline this so it's not such a huge and clunky ordinance just by generalizing these types of uses in accordance with the way they behave um, and the way that they affect surrounding land uses. And that's the intention of what we're doing here. Perfect. Okay, thanks, Charlie. Does anybody have any questions about that before we jump in? Okay. Now, um, one other thing I wanna mention before we, we move too far in, if you were to do a side-by-side -side comparison of the permitted uses versus the not permitted uses in the old table versus this table, there's gonna be some discrepancies. Um, some of which Charlie and I are gonna look at again. Um, there, we've been fighting some formatting issues with this Municode software, where when we, we type something in, sometimes it changes. And when we, we save one thing, it moves things and it, it, it has caused some issues. So I've already gone through and I've done a side-by-side -side comparison. The intention was to leave the uses the same without adjusting, you know, what, if it was permitted before, we're leaving it permitted now. If it was not permitted before, we're leaving it not permitted. Uh, but there are some, actually quite a few that have flipped on us in this iteration of the red line. So as, as I go through this, let me tell you what is intended and what was originally on the tables and that we don't intend to change. Um, and then hopefully that'll help you understand, you know, we, we're really trying not to touch the Ogden Valley uses. We're trying to just leave them as they were already either permitted, conditionally permitted or not permitted without making any changes. Like I mentioned, everything that we're doing here is trying to re-stratify the M1, M2, M3 out west, okay? So the accessory uses, none of these have changed. So these are all the same. So anything that's accessory or uh, customarily incidental to the main use, that's always been permitted, still permitted. A dwelling unit for a night watchman that was permitted before, still permitted now. Retail sales, permitted. Temporary buildings for use as incidental to construction work, still permitted. So this table really hasn't changed, okay? Now this is where we start to separate and stratify and group things into like uses. So this first one we have aeronautical, space base, or defense-based manufacturing. And, Obviously, that's way out west. You know, most of that's only either conditionally or, or permitted in the, the M2 or M3 zones. Um, this first table, aircraft engine testing, not permitted. Aircraft, aircraft parts, not permitted. Missiles, spacecraft, none of that's really anticipated for the Upper Valley. We're not making any changes there. Animal byproduct, harvesting, processing, or refining, um, not permitted. And that was, that was the same before. Animal related uses. Animal hospital was per permitted before, it's still permitted now. Uh, farming, not permitted. We already talked about that not being an allowed use in the MV1 zone. Now this next one, kennel, is one that flipped on us before that was not permitted. And in this red line, it's showing permitted. So I think the intention here is that we'll make sure we correct any of those that flip flopped on us before we get to a final version. But a kennel would not be permitted in, uh, in the MV1 zone. Here's our large concentrated animal feeding operation. So we're injecting that, that's gonna be not permitted. Stockyard, slaughterhouse, those are not permitted. Um, <clears throat> this next one, veterinarian and small animal grooming. In this red line it's showing is permitted, but in the previous table was not permitted. So the intention of the, that we leave it be, it's not a permitted use in the MV1 zone. Any, any questions up till here, you guys? No. Okay. Commercial services, we're kind of going into some more commercial services grouping of uses. <clears throat> um, building material sales yard, that's still not a permitted use. Contractors equipment, this one was um, permitted in the original use table and now we're saying it's conditionally permitted. This one flipped on us as well. So under the existing table, this one was a permitted use and we'll leave that as a permitted use. Okay. Fertilizer um, and soil conditioner manufacturing, that wasn't permitted before, it's still not permitted now. The gas station, not permitted, still not permitted. A laboratory, this one was not permitted and it flipped on us to permitted, so that will still be not permitted. Okay. Uh, machine shop, that one was permitted before and we would still let it be permitted now. Um, metalworking, shaping, assembly, not permitted before, still will be not permitted. Motion picture studio, not permitted, still not permitted. 
um, an outdoor studio, not permitted before, still not permitted. Repairing and rec reconditioning of motor vehicles. Um, this one was not permitted before and this one flipped on us to permitted. So that one will continue to be not permitted. Sandblasting, not permitted uh, before, still not permitted. Okay, moving into commercial sales. <clears throat> Fertilizer, soil conditioners, we're still not allowing that. That was before, we'll, we'll continue to be now. Wrecked car sales, wasn't permitted before, still won't be permitted. Uh, moving into construction material manufacturing. So this is temporary. So this is a, a table where we've grouped these into temporary uses. So mixing facilities for concrete and for rock crushing. These are, because they're temporary, we would say that maybe they could be permitted as a conditional use. Um, so for you know, maybe a temporary construction operation. And that, uh, that would be something new that uh, we haven't seen before. Is there any questions on that being conditional, conditionally permitted? Nope. Okay. Moving on, food manufacturing and packaging. So this is a new grouping specific to food manufa manufacturing and packaging. Okay, alcohol distillery, this was not permitted before and it would still not be permitted. So this one, this one flipped on us. Uh, bakery goods and manufacturing, this was not permitted before and that flipped on us as well. So that would be not permitted. The brewery, Scott, yep. Sorry, um, the alcohol distillery, it, I do think we wanna keep that as permitted. I think that was an oversight. Um, and I'm going to guess chances are that um, when we consolidated the MV1 zone into the M zones, it probably just didn't list it in the MV1 zone. And so we said not permitted because it just plain wasn't listed. I'm thinking it was an oversight. And that we did might, a distillery over there in the M zone. Yeah, and that makes sense because the next use listed is a brewery and that was permitted before. And uh, we're showing it uh, continuing to be permitted. And I think that they're very similar, if not identical uh, processes. So, And I just want to mention for the planning commissioners, um, planning commissioners, as you're reviewing this um, in your own time before the, the public hearing that'll, that'll be coming up um, on it, if there are any of these things that just don't make sense as being allowed in the manufacturing zone, the, the valley manufacturing zone, which is just a small area over by uh, over in the Newtown Eden area, just one small cul-de-sac is where it is. Um, we can make these adjustments. For example, if we if we say if we accidentally omitted alcohol distillery from the zone before, but we want to say it is allowed because we got the uh, New World Distillery down there then um, let's address those and, and change some of those not permitted or even conditionals to permitted, make it a little more simple for uh, landowners to get uh, their permits. Cool. Okay. Uh, dairy and dairy products. That one was uh, not permitted before and it's still not permitted. Fat rendering not permitted before, still not permitted. This was actually a, a specific use that was of concern to one of the food operation or food manufacturing uses out west where fat rendering can be a, a fairly smelly process. So you'll notice that's not permitted anywhere. It's only conditionally permitted out in M3. Uh, food products, small batch, artisan. Uh, this one was permitted before, it will continue to be permitted. Food products, manufacturing, uh, not permitted before, it will continue to be uh, not permitted. Uh, custom meat cutting, excluding slaughtering. <clears throat> that one was permitted before, will continue to be permitted. Meat products, smoking, curing, packaging. That was not permitted before. And let's see, food I'm sorry, I'm, I'm cross-referencing as we go, just to make sure I'm telling you what was there before. Packaging and distribution of food products was not permitted before, and now we're saying it is permitted. Oh, that one's down here. Okay, sorry, I got it offline. So that one was not permitted before, and we're showing you this permitted. So this one will continue to be not permitted as, as packaging and distribution of food products. Same thing with the meat products, smoking, curing, and packaging. That was not permitted before and will continue to not be permitted. Tobacco manufacturing, not permitted. Um, and will continue to be not permitted. 
Okay, moving on to gaseous or liquid non-food manufacturing. So this is a new grouping of uses that is gaseous or liquid and non-food. <clears throat> and this is where we're specifically addressing hazardous products. So this is kind of a new um, use that we want to address for this uh, food manufacturing business out west where they're, they're concerned about this. Um, so specifically, we're talking about chemicals, paints, inks, and other products um, that have the potential of being combustible. They're also, you know, uh, highly gaseous and, and create off gassing concerns. Uh, obviously, that wasn't permitted before up in the in the valley. It still won't be. But here's where we're having some separation or additional separation of this particular use. So if, uh, if this particular use wants to locate in the manufacturing zone, then they need to be located at least 600 feet from any zone boundary. So if they're in a manufacturing zone that is adjacent to an ag zone, there's that 600 additional feet of separation if they're two abutting zones. <clears throat> Does that make sense? Okay, and uh, non-hazardous products wasn't uh, permitted before, still isn't permitted. Okay, a new grouping, mining, rock, or gravel production. You'll notice all of these are not permitted. They'll continue to be not permitted. So this is, you know, mining extraction, gravel extraction, rock crushing. So this is, you know, not a temporary use. This is more of a you know, permitted long-term use. They're not permitted up in the valley. But they also have that additional 600 foot separation from any zone boundary in the, in the West Weber County zoning um, areas. Okay, pharmaceutical grouping, cannabis cultivation, that wasn't permitted before, still won't be. Um, so cultivation and production of cannabis, not permitted before, won't be permitted uh, going forward. Pharmaceuticals generally, um, this one flip-flopped on us, so it was not permitted before, um, and we would, we would continue to, to leave it as not permitted. Okay, processing or refining of raw material into the basic material from which a final or semi-final non-food product can be made. So this is where we're going on the spectrum of raw product to final product. So this is where we're taking and we are processing or refining that raw material into basic materials uh, from which you would then pass it on for final or semi-final production of non-food product items. So it's kind of a grouping within that manufacturing process. Uh, so metals processing and processing and refining that wasn't permitted before will continue to be not permitted. Um, and again, that has that additional separation because of its intensity of use. <clears throat> metals processing or refining on hazardous metals not permitted before, not permitted uh, going forward. And in fact, all of these are going to be the same story. They weren't permitted before. They're not going to be permitted going forward. Um, so we're talking about foundries, large and small. We're talking about plastics, um, organics. Um, you kind of get the idea there. Any questions on those, kind of taking the raw materials into a semi-final product? Doesn't really impact the valley. Okay, next grouping, processing, compounding, assembling, or fabricating of a final or semi-final product from solid materials previously processed or refined. So that's kind of that next step in the manufacturing process. We've We've gotten away from the raw materials. Now we're at kind of that uh, fabrication or final or semi-final product um, process. So batteries, mixing plant uh, for certain construction material, motor vehicle uh, manufacturing, um, hazardous products, uh, non-hazardous products, rubber products. So these are all going to be not permitted except for the non-hazardous. Um, and I believe we didn't address this in the previous use table. So this is one that's kind of new that we're assigning a, uh, a permitted versus not permitted. So this is the this is one that you may want to take a look at as, as being potentially new to the valley. So non-hazardous products, um, the creation. So remember, we're taking semi uh, finished. So we're processing, compounding, assembling, or assembling or fabricating the final product or semi-final product and that would be a permitted use in the mv1 zone do you guys have any concerns about it being permitted in the valley if it's non-hazardous no okay uh, rubber products this again wasn't even mentioned before in the, in the use table but we're defining it now uh, because of the concern at west 
um, that we're saying it would be not permitted. Um, Charlie, do you, now that I'm looking at rubber products again, do you foresee the need to add the 600 foot separation for rubber products? Mm. Yeah, yep, yep, we missed it. Yep, it needs to be there. Okay. Okay, moving on to a new grouping of uses. This is public, quasi public, and institutional uses. So in the original use table, uh, public and quasi-public uses was a permitted use, um, and that will continue to be so um, going forward. Um, we are saying that public safety training facilities would be not permitted, and that would be the case going forward. Um, public transit storage, this one flip-flopped on us before we had it not permitted, and we're, we're showing it as permitted here. So I think the intention would be we go back to not permitted for the storage of public transport. Uh, as a public transport storage facility. Um, recreational center, that was permitted before, and so it's showing permitted going forward as well. So that isn't changing. Okay, recreational. Uh, Go-kart racing, that, <laughs> that was not permitted before, and it's showing permitted now, so that will be changed to not permitted again. Uh, <laughs> uh, outdoor as well so indoor and outdoor well I guess there's a question do you guys want to allow for an indoor go-kart <laughs> facility <laughs> uh, outdoor we're saying it would not be permitted um, it, it really wasn't addressed in the previous um, use table outdoor track for racing here it is. Track or course for motor vehicle competition outdoor. That was not permitted before. It's still not permitted now. Shooting range wasn't permitted before. Still isn't permitted now. Um, a recreational uh, private outdoor. It's not necessarily a consistent use with the manufacturing zone. So it wasn't permitted and, and won't be permitted going forward. Um, so the before the use table had separated this track or course for motor vehicle competition as being outdoor without spectators or outdoor with spectators. Um, it wasn't permitted before, it still isn't permitted now. So that's kind of where we may get in and, and make it a little bit more specific where we don't have such similar uses that are taking up two line items in a use table you know, for additional cleanup at a later time. Um, indoor course or track for racing. We're saying it's permitted, but this actually wasn't in the use table prior. And I think that we may want to actually put this as not permitted as well. If we're not going to allow for a go-kart track indoors, I don't think it makes sense to have a, a larger scale track indoors either. So that will be changed to not permitted. Okay, and then off-road uh, tracker course, that uh, obviously is not permitted either. Okay, storage. Self-storage. So self-storage was already a permitted use in the MV1 and it's still a permitted use um, in the table going forward. Same thing with recreational vehicle storage. It was permitted before and will be permitted going forward. Outdoor storage wasn't permitted before, but it, it uh, still would not be permitted going forward. Okay, textiles, not permitted. Carpet and rug manufacturing and dyeing. Dry cleaning, not permitted. Textile manufacturing or maintenance, not permitted. Oh, sorry, it shows as permitted, but uh, we would have that be not permitted. Um, upholstering, including furniture manufacturing, rebuilding, and renovating. Um, this one, I think, was permitted before. It's kind of a, an upholstery shop or a, you know, like a furniture shop, and indoor, obviously, it was a permitted use. Is there any concern about that type of use being permitted going forward? Nope. Okay. okay, transportation, non-manufacturing. So airport, 
indoor freight transfer, outdoor freight transfer, parking lot. Uh, the first three here are not permitted, uh, would continue to be not permitted. Outdoor parking lots would be permitted, parking structure permitted, uh, rail yards um, not permitted, truck service station not permitted. I think those were all consistent with the original use table. Um, waste disposal and recycling, um, all of these are gonna be not permitted. So automobile, automobile wrecking yard, automobile recycling, um, disposal destruct, reduction or dumping of animal byproducts, incinerators, solid waste dump, radioactive waste, uh, recycling facilities. So obviously those are still not permitted. Okay, that's all of the use tables. Did I bore you to death and <laughs> complicate everything? Was there anything in there that was, was a red flag as we talked through it? The only thing that stood, about, stood out to me was the storage of construction equipment. Can you, it was one of the first maybe 10 items that you went through. Yeah. I thought you said that was not permitted. Let's take a look here. <clears throat> okay, contractors, equipment, storage yard, or rental of equipment used by contractors, indoor or outdoor. So it was listed as a permitted use in the original use tables. You know, it looks like it's showing as conditional. Is it your, your desire to keep it as permitted or as conditional? Uh, conditional is fine, right? All they got to do is apply for a conditional land use permit, right? That's right. Uh -huh. I, I don't think there's a problem with that. I think just restricting that would be a mistake. But if it's a conditional permit, I don't think that's an issue. Okay. No I mean, a guy has a track hoe. That's his business. It basically is saying that he can't park it on his own property, right? Yeah. Yep. If he owns a business and he's operating a, you know, a storage yard for that business equipment. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. Any other questions or comments about the use table? Okay, like I said, we'll go back through and just make sure the formatting doesn't flip flop on us again, and we will um, we'll send that out for your your review before we have it scheduled for public comment and public hearing and a decision and action on your guys's part. Okay, um, now in the the manufacturing zoning ordinance, there's after the use tables that we have special regulations that more. Um, more specifically describe how some of these uses can uh, operate in some of their you know, special regulations. And so in this list of uh, special regulations, we've added a few and, and adjusted a few based on the edits made in the tables, and, but also uh, you know, to make sure that some of these large food manufacturing operations out west have you know, adequate protection from some of these uses. So you'll notice here in B, um, we're, we're describing, you know, more specific requirements for an automobile wrecking yard or junkyard. And so we've listed this, this you shall be enclosed within a solid wall or fence of not less than seven feet in height. In the M2 zone, this you shall be located at least three, 600 feet from any zone boundary. So I'm just adding a little bit more protection there to that you know, specific use. Uh, building materials and sales yard in the, MV, in the M1 and M2 zones. Uh, that's where we're adding the M2 zone there to that, uh, to that specific requirement. Uh, we're adding more information for a mixing plant of uh, certain construction materials. So the following standards apply to a mixing plant. Um, so we're, we're basically saying that it's applicable uh, everywhere. The cement silo mixer shall not be larger than 300 barrels. You know, period. We're not going to go into more details as far as which zone that's referring to. Just kind of clean up. Um, moving further down, mixing facility for asphalt or concrete. So this is the temporary mixing facility for these uh, construction materials. So the following standards apply um, to one of these temporary mixing facilities. So the cement silo mixer shall not be larger than 200 barrels. There shall not be more than two cement trucks and no more than two other semi trucks and trailers used with this operation stored on site. Uh, no more than 40 yards of sand or gravel mix stored on this site. Uh, the sand and gravel mix shall be stored in a three wall bin covered not when in use. And, and it goes on. Obviously, what we're trying to do is limit the scale of the operation here uh, because it is temporary. We don't want it to become this, this large, you know, 
operation that looks like it's permanent. Hey, Scott. And, yep. Not to be picky, but 40 yards isn't a whole lot of sand or gravel. You sure is about it? that? That's pretty small. It that's, is. Four that's four truckloads. <laughs> I mean, that's minimal. On a, on a temporary operation, what do you guys think would be more uh, adequate as far as scale is concerned? Well, you're just, you know, they're going to be making batches, I suppose, and they're going to run out of stuff pretty quick if you only have four there. I, I don't know what's practical, but I just doubt that is. Yeah, and this is the this is storage, right? So we're just saying that we're, we don't want that more than that stored on site as the temporary storage. Um, it may be, maybe my understanding of how these mixing facilities operates is a little bit limited, but when you guys are operating, you know, a, a mixing facility for you know close by construction operation isn't it kind of like a revolving door where you have materials arriving and being mixed uh, but that the storage requirements aren't as high i think that could be a conditional conditional use and be reviewed don't put restrictions on it to where they couldn't operate a a mixing plant but maybe it gets reviewed as a conditional permit allowing more if it's necessary for the operation. Yeah, as, that would make uh, sense. As needing a conditional use permit already. So maybe what we could do is we could say 40 yards by entitlement, but planning commission can consider more than 40 yards by conditional use permit or something like that. Yeah, something something to where it doesn't completely restrict them from doing something there. Yeah. Okay, and just to make sure everyone knows that the 40 yards is what's already written in your code. We just um, revised it, uh, uh, essentially revised the formatting of it, um, but it already it, it, it's currently limited to 40 yards in the code. So we can, but we can adjust it if you guys want to. Yeah. Yeah, just. Okay. Scott, I have, well. if you're done with that, I had a question back on the stockyards. Okay. If you go back to there. In the use table. Uh, Commissioner, was that in the use table you were referring to? Or is yes, that... yeah. Okay, yeah, let me go find it real quick. I think that was under animal use. It was, yeah, towards the top. Okay, here's our animal related uses, stockyards. So, so listed as not permitted in the MV1. So is there any um, standards on stockyards on the size? It's not the APO CAFO size, is it? I mean, if they had, and what's the definition of stockyards then? All right, how are you defining that? Let's take a look. <clears throat> Unless Charlie, do you know off the top of your head if there's a size associated with that definition? Oh, this is a it's a really good question. Um, we've got stockyards, and we've got um, I think we have animal feedlot. Uh, we say things a little bit differently in our code than the concentrated animal feed operation code that's been written in in state code, um, and so it's. Uh, yeah, something what we need to address. Essentially, a stockyard is a, a holding area where they're being fed, like a concentrated feed operation, but they're being held there uh, awaiting slaughter, mm -hmm. um, essentially, or or being sent to market or whatever. Yeah, uh, or just don't be, they're sold or whatever. So. Which I mean, most most people who are running a concentrated feed operation, they're holding the cattle for the same reason, right? They're not they're not pets. They're they're being held for marketable purposes. And so I don't know that there's a huge difference between a stockyard and a, and, a, and a feed operation. A large concentrated animal feed operation, I think that's like 600 head or more. Right. And so maybe a stockyard is kind of like a, a small concentrated feed operation, which we can make the language consistent. In fact, I'd, I'd love to see us do that. Yeah, if uh, that's why I asked if there were numbers tied to that in the chart or with the determination, because there again, and I'm sorry, I wasn't clear on your answer when I asked if, if it is an agricultural area that's grandfathered in this manufacturing area. Are you saying then, would they still be able if they have 
a, a small stockyard operation to continue with that? They would. Yep, they would. Uh -huh. So any change that we make can't affect anyone who's established um, a use. And so they'd essentially be a, a lawfully permitted non-conforming use. Um, they technically, according to our code, wouldn't be able to expand their use, but they'd be able to continue on um, exactly as they are. Okay. And we do have a few large concentrated animal feed operations out west that we certainly don't want to inhibit their ability to continue to do business. And so we're, we are going to address it with a little bit of uh, some minor cha changes um, in language. But um, essentially, the, the goal is to not allow more uh, or sorry, new large concentrated animal feed operations. That doesn't mean that a small concentrated animal feed operation like a stockyard wouldn't be allowed. Yeah, and uh, keep, keep in mind the scale of a large animal feed operation. I mean, we're talking quite a lot right, of right. Cows and thousands of pigs. Right. <laughs> it gets pretty big. So one of the challenges with changing the word stockyard to small concentrated animal feed operation or just concentrated feed operation is the word stockyard is actually used in uh, quite a few other uh, zones as well. And so uh, we could change it to concentrated animal feed operation to be consistent with the new um, state code requirement. Um, but if we do that, it's not consistent with all those other zones. So then either we change all the other zones and then we figure out what kind of negative consequences that has. And it's just kind of <laughs> pulling right. a thread and seeing if we could completely uh, uh, unweave the entire zoning code. And we, we don't want to unweave the whole thing. We just want to surgically uh, right. you know, tie the thread off or something. <laughs> so I'd suggest we keep it at stockyards for now. We do have a long-term goal of making all of our land use tables consistent with each other. And at that time, I, I think we should try and bite that, that much harder question off. Yeah. All right, thank you. Okay. okay. We'll head back down. Okay, we made a note of uh, allowing 40 yards of storage on the temporary mixing plants with the ability to increase that storage through the conditional use permit allowance. Any other questions on the temporary mixing facility language here? No, that sounds good for now. Okay. Good deal. Uh, just a, a clarification, changing permitted to allowed under the retail sales language here. Um, kind of just a cleanup item. Uh, the next amendments here are talking more about the lot development standards in the manufacturing zones. So previously we had minimum lot widths of 100 feet in, uh, in any of the manufacturing zones for new lots created. Um, and uh, to be consistent in the commercial zones, for example, we've gone down to zero lot width standards. And we think that makes sense in the manufacturing zones as well. And so we've carried that thinking over to the, uh, the tables here for, for development standards in the M zones. So you, you guys foresee any issues with that? Okay. In the setback tables, we've added just a couple of clarifications to some of the restrictions of setbacks. So in the front yard setback, for example, uh, 30 feet in the MV1 zone is your front yard setback. But if, uh, if you're adjacent to a right of way that either exists or is planned to become as big as 80 feet or wider, then we would want to have a larger front yard setback. So that's where we would jump up to 50 feet. So we're just adding a little bit of clarifying language there. Um, I don't believe that that is actually applicable at the moment in the MV1 zone, given the fact that all the zoning for MV1 is in a cul-de-sac where the right of, right of way won't be 80 feet, but uh, just a clarification for the rest of the manufacturing zones. Side yard setback, um, we're saying none except 20 feet. Uh, where the lot is adjacent to a residential zone. So we're just adding a little bit of clarification in there. Same thing on the rear yard setback. So it is a, we don't have any rear yard setbacks, except there is a 30 foot setback um, where the lot rears on a residential zone, not just the building, but the lot itself. So if, you're, if you're boundering, your boundary is with a residential zone, then you need to have additional setback on the rear. Okay. Any questions on those site development standards before we move on as far as the, the lot width or some of those setback clarifications? 
section. Okay, this next section is in our uh, design review code. So this is in the application and review requirements of a design review application. So keep in mind, design review applications are required for any new commercial or manufacturing uh, land use permits. And so anybody who wants to you know, build something in the MV1 zone would have to go through a design review before they're issued a building permit. So in the application and review requirements, we're adding a, a section here where if, for example, a manufacturing site is being developed under a development um, agreement, that we would allow for the site uh, or the, the design review to be waived by the county commission if the design is accounted for in that development agreement. Um, but it does, I'll just read the language here and we can talk through it if you have any concerns, but it says that the applicability of the provisions of this chapter may be waived or modified by the county commission by means of an executed and recorded development agreement. The specific waiver or modification shall be explicitly stated in the development agreement. The specific waiver or modification is subject to a public hearing with and recommendation from the planning commission prior to county commission final decision. So it still is something that would come before you um, as a board for review and recommendation in that development agreement. But if the development agreement has been reviewed, recommended and passed by the county commission, then we wouldn't have them go back through design review if it's already been addressed in the uh, development agreement. Do you guys have any questions on that? Cool. Okay. <clears throat> this next amendment is um, a housekeeping item. Um, this section 108 is in our, in our standard section and uh, chapter three is the cluster subdivision um, section of our standards code. So one thing that we found is we were missing a allowance in the cluster lot standards that is present in other residential zones. Um, that was kind of an oversight. And so we'd like to add that in here where if, for example, you own a lot in a cluster subdivision and you wanna build an accessory building, let's say in your backyard, the rear setback was left silent for an accessory building where it's defined in other residential you know, zoning um, language. So what we'd like to add here to be consistent with the other sections is that for an accessory building, you can have that accessory building one foot off of the rear property line um, unless that rear property line is a on a corner lot adjacent to a street. And in that, in that regard, it would have to be 10 feet away from that property line adjacent to a street. And that would match the rest of the residential allowances for accessory buildings. We had a, an individual come in looking to get a land use permit and we found that this language was missing. Um, where we would have expected it to match the rest of the residential allowances. Do you have any questions on adding that clarification into the cluster lot development standards? Okay. And then from here, it just shows that we are repealing the use table for the manufacturing zone. So that's just kind of showing that we're, we're going to those other tables. And that is the, the ordinance that we've got drafted so far. Uh, again, still has some cleanup. We'll bring you guys a clean copy to review um, prior to any public comment or public hearing um, and recommendation action on your part. But we wanted to get this before you. Um, there's been quite a bit of pressure out west to get some of these changes to help attract one of these larger businesses. So we've been We've been pushing to get this through, um, but we, we, this is one of those steps where technically it impacts the Upper Valley because the Upper Valley does have a manufacturing zone, uh, but the impacts are, are pretty minimal. Um, do you guys have any questions, you know, as far as the overall intent or, you know, the process going forward on this? Okay. Our goal is to have it back before you for a public hearing on the 28th of December, assuming we have a, a quorum and we can keep that uh, meeting scheduled. So that gives us th about three weeks to clean it up and get it over to you in advance. So that's kind of on our horizon and kind of our tentative um, 
time frame. And with that, I'll pass it back over to you, Chair Lewis. Okay, well, thanks, Scott. Um, yeah. Appreciate you getting it to us before we meet so we have time to review. And I do think you should reconsider indoor go-karts. We're happy to if that's what you guys want. I don't think that's, you know. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that would be a good idea. Um, okay, uh, any uh, further remarks from planning commissioners? Uh, John, how are we going to yeah. get a copy of all this so we could study this further? Absolutely. Yep. Yes, you will. Okay. Anything else? Um, I know Rick is missing. So, how about uh, Cortland? Do you have any uh, additional comments? Uh, no, I don't have anything. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks for all your work tonight, Scott. We really appreciate it. And, commissioners, thanks for your time tonight. Everybody have a great night, and I'll adjourn the meeting. Thanks, Commissioner. Thank everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.